So you finished the score. It's finally done. And now you have to embark on the journey that is making parts. And here's the thing. Parts are arguably more important than the score. Like, yeah, of course the score is really important, but it's the parts that people play from. Those are the ones that really make it come alive. I know I said in the last video that nothing derails a session more than the score being incomplete or, or poorly put together, and that is true. But the only thing that is going to be more detrimental to a session is going to be bad parts, parts that aren't clear, parts that require lots of questions to be asked, the parts that are poorly formatted. Uh, and you want to avoid that. And they're easy to kind of mess up because parts are usually at the very end of the process. Most people, you know, if you've got a deadline breathing down your neck, you're lucky enough to get the piece written and formulated and finished and then to get the score really well done. And then after that, you really dive into the parts. It can just be really easy to start taking shortcuts as the deadline line is breathing down your neck. It's completely understandable, but you owe it to yourself and you owe it to your players to give them really good parts. So my name is David Vess. I'm a composer and this is a video about how to make your parts professional. So just like when we talked about scores, parts also have very different conventions, especially depending on the medium that you're going to be writing in. Let's take orchestra, for example, right? When orchestra wrote orchestra parts, we look at the violins, we separate them by first and second, right? First get their own part, second get their own part. We usually only put measure numbers at the top of systems. Uh, we don't have every single measure marked. And we use cues as a way of giving the instrumentalists a better idea of what's going on while they're resting so that they can be paying attention to the music and so that they can come in. Either. But if you take an orchestra and you put it in film world and it's for a recording session, well then the parts are gonna be very different from that. Where normally we would separate the firsts and seconds, we would actually have the violins together and we might have first and second you know, divided, but you were going to see it on one physical part. There's just a violin part that has the divisions written out. And the reason for that is because let's say you want to do an overdub of something where you don't have a budget for a lot of string players and you want to record, you know, that first violin melody a couple of times with the full section and then layer it on top of itself. Remember, the parts are made for a recording. They're not necessarily made to be performed live with, you know, on stage. So they're just different conventions that go into it. Leading into that, the measure numbers would be different. In a recording session, we don't want to waste time people being like, oh, I got to start and measure 18. Oh, where, where is that? I got to find that. Every single measure will have, every single measure has the number written in on every single part. So before I go any further, I have to acknowledge that everyone, and I mean everyone, does this differently. Every single person does this slightly differently. I'm going to say things that people are going to disagree with, that's okay. That's totally fine. Um, these are just things that I have learned that I definitely was not aware of when I first got into this crazy business of, of writing music and getting parts and scores to people. Before we get too deep into the woods here, we should make a very general idea that parts are really for instrumentalists as a general rule singers don't really sing like from a, a part like it's not like, like if you have a choir you're not gonna give the tenor like the tenor part they're gonna read from a score it's also true in opera as well where you might have a multiple singers you know doing different types of roles well they're gonna all read from the vocal score it's gonna just have all the singers information and it's gonna have if it's for orchestra they might have a piano reduction and that's really what they're gonna see, but they don't really, singers don't really do parts. Uh, even if you're doing something where it, you know, the singer is the featured voice and you have, a, you know, some instrumental things, the instruments will get parts, but the singer will almost always read from some type of score. Now, the only other outlier from this is really the piano. When it's in a chamber setting, the pianist is going to read from a score. The instruments on the stage will be smaller and the piano part will be the normal size, but they're going to read from a score. The only time we really see the piano doing something that's like a pure instrumental part is when they're playing in orchestra or wind ensemble and they're not the soloist. That's really the only times. We have to talk about paper. Paper sizes for parts are important. Different publishers are going to use different sizes of paper for making their, their, making their parts. If you are someone who is self-publishing, you're probably just going to stick with whatever the normal size printing paper is. So in the U.S., that would be letter size, and that's totally fine. Well, you kind of want to think of them that way as rather than like separate sheets of paper, that can, that's a mess. I don't recommend that. 
having them as some bound together as some type of booklet is going to be your best bet for making uh, for making your part. Okay, so the first thing that you're going to do when it comes to making parts is you're going to go through every single part individually and you're going to literally go line by line and check it. 90% of the problems that I see with people's parts just come from the fact that people don't usually want to take the time to check them. They think, oh, okay, I did it already in the score. It's probably fine in the part. Don't, don't make that mistake. There are going to be some serious things that you'll need to check. You know, some things like the tempos being moved to the wrong place or dynamics uh, being drawn to the wrong part. There's lots of details that can get lost. And it's not, it doesn't take forever. Just start with the first part, literally walk through it, see what's going on, go line by line, do the dynamics make sense, do the commands make sense, are the tempos visible, is everything clear, did they have everything that they need? That's literally the first part. We're not concerned about formatting, we're not concerned about making anything. You shouldn't be adding anything to the parts at this point, you're just literally checking that all the information is correct. Go through the parts and actually check them. After you've checked each individual part, it's now going to be time to start adding in cues. What is a cue? A cue is essentially an excerpt of the score that is inside of the part. Now, cues are essential to any good part. They are, and they're very easy to make. They are, they serve multiple purposes and they have different jobs depending on the particular context or medium that you're going to be in. It allows the player to see what's going on in, you know, if you're a tuba player and you're sitting in the back and you don't, you have a lot of measure rests, you can see what's going on in the trumpet part so that you can say, oh, they're playing that. Oh, I'm a couple measures away from that. I know when to come in. And that's really it. They're there to just make the piece easier to read. They are visually different than the rest of the performed music for the player because it's smaller. It's literally made physically smaller so that it's clear that this is just information, this is just music that's passing by, but it's not what you are going to play in the part. In wind ensemble world, cues have a slightly different job. They do everything that I just said that they do in orchestra. They are 100% there to help people understand what's going on in the music and make the music overall easier to read. Wind ensemble cues also have to facilitate instrumental alternatives for instruments that some bands don't have. You might have written a really cool English horn solo for your high school band piece and it you know it gets performed and hey that's wonderful but the band down the street and you know in the other school well they don't have an English horn player and they don't have a baritone sax player. You don't want people to say, oh, well, I, I don't want to I don't want to purchase this guy's music. I don't want to play it because there's no alternative. So you need to put in the parts an instrument that could cover that. So, you know, an English horn, what are some more common band instruments that you could give them that solo that fits the similar register, that fits the similar sort of range, that is a nice alternative for bands that maybe don't have access to instruments. It's really important for that, especially if you're gonna be writing like educational pieces like middle school band and things like that. Like some bands don't have many of the instruments. I know where I come from. There's no, we didn't have a contra bassoon. We didn't even have a bassoon. Actually, I think we had one, but it was like, you didn't want to touch it. It was something, it was like in a closet for thousands of years or something like that. So the music had cues in it. I played tuba, so I got a lot of bassoon cues and a lot of Barry Sachs cues, and low instrument people. So you want to think about that strategically as you're going through it. Okay, like, am I adding an alternative so that makes your music more sellable, more accessible? To I remember I did a commission uh, one time and I put a lot of stuff in the French horn parts. How many horns do you guys have? And like, oh yeah, we've got four horns horns and bands, you should go for it. And so silly me, you know, wrote these really wild, you know, uh, busy horn parts. And then we got to the, we got to the rehearsal and I was like, oh yeah, where's the, all this stuff? We'd be going through it and it's completely empty. Oh, well that's a lot of horn three and horn four. Yeah. Didn't you say you have four? Oh, well we did that semester, but we don't, have, we don't have four horns as a general rule. And so I, you know, that opened, really opened my eyes that in wind ensemble, there needs to be some kind of alternative, not for everything. It's just worth thinking about. In film world, cues are a little different. Uh, we really actually kind of want to avoid them in parts. The only time that we really use a cue in film music is when we have a specific reorchestration in mind that we want to do. Like we want to, you know, you might want to have an alternate take where you say, you know what, instead of the English horn doing this, we're going to have the trumpet do it. You don't actually, in that case, you wouldn't really want any cues. You don't want to clutter the page. You want to give them exactly what they are doing and they will come in on time because that's what you're paying for. 
ideally. In chamber world, they are essential. You gotta have cues. Oh my God. Cause there's no conductor. You don't have the benefit of someone beating time for you. You have to figure it out with yourself. It just helps makes it so much easier for your players, especially when they're reading something the first time for them to know, oh, you're doing this there. I can already come in, I can jump in. It just expedites the process. It just makes it so much easier. As you are adding cues to your parts, you a, a, a place you always want to put them is going to be at tempo changes please put cues at tempo changes. It, it just makes it so much easier for the player to understand what's going on. Not only will you have the conductor beating in time, but you can also see the horns have the melodies and they're actually in quarter notes now. If they're not playing, put a cue of what's going on. And when you're doing this as a general rule for, for cues, please put the most rhythmically interesting thing that you can. No one's gonna be helped if it's like a, a whole note in the third clarinet part. What is the most interesting thing? What is my ear gonna immediately understand is going on? That's what you want. And you also wanna be clear, in music that repeats, that might not have a actual repeat sign that is written, you wanna make sure that when you put in the cue that it isn't something that happens multiple times, or if it is, you make it clear to the player. I remember accidentally making the mistake one time of playing some older piece that had the cue, this trumpet part repeated. I remember seeing the trumpet cue, so I thought, oh, we're here, I'm gonna come in. And I didn't realize that the cue was only for the second time that they came in. Uh, you know, I had lost count, and so I came in way early and kind of screwed it up. You just want to think about these things. I know they're silly psychological little things, but they're they're really they're really important. As you're going along, also think about how you can break as many multi-rests as possible. If you don't pay attention to multi-rests, something like this will happen. Y'all, that was terrible. Let's, let's start again. Let's start again. How's, uh, how's 47? 47 good? Everyone got 47? 47? Everyone got 47? 47? Okay. All right, here we go. <gasps> okay. I know that was stupid. But I can't tell you how many times that has happened because people did not think about their multi-rests and you end up screwing up. You don't know when to come in because you don't know where you started and the conductor is never paying attention to people in the back row. It's just really worth paying attention to. I try and break multi-rests that are five measures or larger. If it's five or less, it's usually fine to keep. I do that intentionally because I, I treat every piece as if it's gonna go into a reading session. So realistically, you could do eight to 10 measures at a time. I don't know. I, I cut it down. I assume everything is going to be for a reading session. I just want to make it clear for people. I'd, I'd rather spend more on ink and pages uh, and people can see what's going on. It just it, it just eliminates the risk and I think that that's I think that's just a better choice. As you're going through each one, take the cue that you're going to make and you switch the viewer back to the score. You can see all the instruments that are resting at the time. Copy and paste that right on in there. It will save you so much time. Cues should be anywhere from one measure to three measures long, occasionally more. On the page itself, there should be eight to nine systems maximum. Eight to nine is kind of the sweet spot. I usually shoot for eight, uh, but I and, and nine if I absolutely have to, but I, I think less is more. There are going to be times where you will need to do even less to facilitate a page turn. Remember, you want to give your players room to write instructions from the conductor on the parts, right? Parts are meant to be written in. They're supposed to be like, oh, actually, you know, we need this a little louder here. Depending on the balance of the group and the room, the conductor is going to ask for different dynamics or different instructions or whatever, and they need to be able to write with pencil and paper on the part. If you don't give them room, you're making their job harder. So don't do that. Give them a little bit more room, eight to nine systems per page. As you're formatting each of these, be aware of where the large sections are landing, like a new section, a new tempo, things that have a double bar, and really think about how your eye gets to that on the page. For parts, there's not really the same requirement of a certain number of measures per system. Like if you're doing an ostinato or something, it's okay to, to have you know quite a few measures on there as long as it's clear what's going on. Every example of that is gonna be completely different depending on the piece. Just, it's worth thinking about. One of the things that you really want to be aware of that is an enormous pain in the ass that you're gonna encounter as you're going through this formatting process is thinking about page turns. Do not underestimate the power 
of a bad page turn. And it's like, it's the dumbest thing in the world. It shouldn't be an issue, but oh my God, I have seen people really like if you, a bad page turn at a crucial moment in a piece can completely ruin a take. It can ruin a, a, a reading session. Just, it's, it's really worth thinking about. What that means for you is that every second page, as you go along in the document, needs to have a, a certain number of rests for the player to literally turn the page. Now you can have cues, because remember they don't play during the cue, they just read the cue. So if the cue is at the bottom of the page, that's fine because I can, I can turn the page over as I'm going. Uh, you can have music running all the way up to the page, but it's gonna stress your player out the first time that they're reading it. And if it's a reading session, well, you don't wanna do that because then they have to turn the page very quickly and they might not know that there are rests on the side. So it's always good, even if you have like a multi measure rest, let's say you have like one group of six measures before they play on the next page, you might break it and do one on the on the page so that we can see, oh, I've got a measure of rest, and then I turn it over, and then I'm, good, I'm still counting and I'm good to go. Now, this means that as you're going through it, you may have to do things where you don't have eight or nine systems on a page. You might only have like five or six because you've got to facilitate that page turn. The page turn is more important. It's, it's always gonna be more important. One of the ways you can do this is if it's a two page document or if it happens to go maybe two or three, you may consider adding a title page uh, to the document purely for the purposes of avoiding the page turn. I mean, because remember, parts are booklets. They're not individual pages. As a general rule, parts don't need a title page. Literally, the only reason we use them is to facilitate page turns. So if you need to have one for a page turn and some of your parts have title pages and the others don't, that's fine. You might get a weird look, but remember, it, that doesn't matter. What matters is avoiding the page turn. Something to keep in mind as you're making these is that, especially when we're in orchestra world, all of the winds, all of the brass, and all of the percussionists are all soloists, right? They don't have a, a, a section mate to care about doing the page turns with you. They're by themselves. So you abs it is essential that you take care of that problem for them. Now, the exception to that would be the strings, right? Because obviously there's not just one first violin, unless it's conductor's orchestra, because like there's never enough. Um, you know, they, they have a section. They have a whole section to work with, and they usually have a stand partner. They have someone sitting next to them. They share the stand, and the second player is going to be the one that turns the pages. Sometimes you run into that with strings where it's less important to worry about it. Ideally, it should always have a good page turn. You should still be trying to do that, but that's a like worst case scenario. Well, strings, they can kind of take care of themselves because they have an extra person to share the stand with. Um, it's a little different in band world where sometimes you might have, you know, like there might be two people playing trombone one or whatever. Uh, but generally speaking, you want to approach it as if the parts are soloists and that they, they, they're self-sufficient. One person can play it and turn the page and you're gonna be fine. In wind ensemble, the, sometimes we have what's called a combined part where we have, you know, let's say like horn one and two are actually like, that's the part, like the part is for horn one and two is technically for two separate parts. I'm not a huge fan of this. In orchestra, we you wanna avoid that like the plague. Uh, in wind ensemble, it's a little different. Um, I, I, I think it's better to not do that. But again, you know, you have to do what works for you and, and your system. If you're ever in doubt, talk to the band director that you're gonna be working with. As we approach the end here, do one last look over. Have a friend look at it. If you have a friend who's an instrumentalist, have them look through the parts. They'll find stuff, they'll find things. And that is essentially it. If you've thought about the cues, if you've thought about the page turns, if you've thought about the formatting and you've checked it, all the information in there, your parts are probably gonna be okay. It's going to be time to print them now. Remember, because parts are booklets, and you might not have the luxury of a nice printer with the tabloid booklet thing and, and it's all done for you and it's nice and it comes automatically stapled. You might not have access to that. You might have to physically bind it with tape. That's fine, that's okay. When you're doing this, don't make the mistake of saying, oh, I'm all done, I'll, uh, I'll put it together as a single document, all of the parts together as a single document and then click double page print because what might happen is that you might have a, a, a disagreeable number of even and odd page numbers for each part. So your second bassoon's fourth page might end up being printed on the same piece of paper as the first page of the first horn. And that doesn't help anyone because they can't share that. So I've made that mistake before. So don't get hasty. You want to print them all individually. 
it sucks. I mean, hey, that, pff, this is part of the this is part of the deal. Good luck. You're gonna do the thing, and they're gonna play it, and it's gonna be uh, it's gonna be great. It's gonna be a really good time. Thank you so much for watching. I hope this is helpful to you. I hope that you find it. This took me forever to learn all of these different things, and I'm still you know learning and and, and growing and getting better at it. What are some of the things that you struggle with when uh, when you're making your parts, or what are some of the things that you know you do that make your parts stand out just a little bit, make them look really good? Uh, put it in. Leave me a comment. I, I read every single one. I'd love to hear from you um did i miss anything you know let me know in the comments below i would, I would really appreciate it okay thanks so much cheers go make some noise